we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's going to be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. We have evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities? Mars was inhabited, and these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me. We're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. Hi, I'm George Nori, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Richard Serrett coming to you live from my home studio in Old Thornhill, just north of Toronto. Pioneering UFO and ET contactee George Adamski claimed he was visited by Nordic aliens. He wrote three books about his experiences. Now, his critics claim the supposed alien crafts in his films and photographs were cobbled together using light bulbs or other household items. Although Adamski is labeled, was labeled a hoaxer, he continued to deliver his message from the beings he called the Space Brothers. He continued to insist aliens lived on most planets in the solar system. Nonetheless, his images of cigar-shaped motherships and strange craft flying in formation are among the most famous in UFO history. Coming up next, Dutch author, educator Gerard Artsen insists that recent scientific discoveries confirm much of Adamski's seemingly outlandish claims. My conversation with Gerard Artson begins after this timeout on Coast to Coast AM. Gerard Artson is an author, speaker, researcher, and educator from Amsterdam. He's been a lifelong student of the ageless wisdom teaching, which holds that at the beginning or end of each cosmic cycle or age, a teacher returns. With a new revelation about the source and evolution of consciousness that needs to be given expression by living according to the golden rule to establish right human relations. Gerard, <clears throat> excuse me, Gerard is also the author of eight books and about the extraterrestrial presence, which he sees as further evidence of the evolution of consciousness and the universal manifestation of life. His research into George Adamski signaled a thorough reassessment of this major case of contact and led to his rediscovering of Adamski's work. Gerard is the author of Pioneers of Oneness, The Science and Spirituality of UFOs and the Space Brothers, and the Adamski Book of UFO UAP Disclosure, Early Evidence and Answers Now Confirmed by Science. Gerard Artson, welcome to Coast to Coast. How are you? Good morning, Richard. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Um, when Ad Adamski came to um, uh, America as a young man, I guess, from, from Poland, um, was he um, interested in UFOs before his first, I guess, you know, documented sighting in, in 1946? Or was that something that came later? Well, when he came to the States, he was a he was a young boy, I believe, just two years old, um, and I uh, I doubt if he was aware of uh, of anything uh, uh, like flying saucers at the time. Like almost no one was, uh, despite, of course, uh, you know these uh, strange craft having been sighted uh, through the centuries. 
Um, and um, if if he was interested later in life, um, he became a, he became a metaphysics teacher at uh, in around 1928, um, and established well yeah and when and established himself in the Los Angeles area. And if he was interested in in extraterrestrial life, then it doesn't reflect in anything uh, that still exists in terms of his his publications. Um, he, his first published um, text uh, signaling his interest in in um, in life outside planet Earth. Uh, was titled uh, The Possibility of Life on Other Planets. And it was a brochure published in 1946, uh, the same year that he, uh, I think he made his first sightings and, and uh, shortly after followed by uh, the first photographs that he took. Right. So let's let's talk about, um, he had a ranch near um, Palomar Gardens in in, um, in California, near the, the campground, the Gardens Cafe. Uh, October 9th, 1946, during a meteor shower, he and his friends. Um, well, you take it from there. What happened? What did he see? He and his friends, October ninth, nineteen forty-six. Um, he saw if if uh, excuse me if he saw uh, what uh, was witnessed by uh, um, thousands of other people in uh, in the area, um, a spacecraft apparently, um, and. Uh, this was reported on the radio, um, and um, he and his friends, um, yeah, they they witnessed this uh, this strange craft, which they uh, recognized as not being uh, uh, an airplane, as they were known then. Um, and uh, it was, I think, it was just you know him and and his uh, group of his students and friends who were. Um, um, Staying on that on that ranch, or uh, yeah, there was I don't know. It, it was in Palomar Gardens um, already. Let me check. Um, and it, it was it was reported in in various uh, um, in in various uh, news uh, uh, outlets, small outlets, but in the in the area. Right. This was a, a huge cigar shaped craft that he he saw and photographed. Um, I I'm not aware that he uh, photographed it. Oh, he, oh, he didn't photograph the first one. That that came later. Okay. Uh, yes, right. yes. As far as I'm aware, yes. Um, and no. it was reported on the 18th of October in the Marine Corps uh, Corps che- Chevron and and uh, another uh, local newspaper. Um, it was during a met- meteor shower, and but it was also witnessed by hundreds of other people in the San Diego area. And it was called a giant spaceship, and and um, uh, the Los Angeles Daily News also reported it. Yes. And it wasn't how many years after? I mean, he he started lecturing about uh, because he saw. I guess he he claimed he saw something like 184 UFOs just passing over uh, Palomar Gardens uh, in one night. Right, 184 in one night. Oh, that could be. I, 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 I'm yeah. not, you know, I'm not keeping tabs on on all the details. I, I do right. know that in 1947 he took his first photographs um, of uh, flying saucer as it passed across the moon. He had very, um, very, um, um, you know, in in, uh, uh, in in terms of current standards, very primitive equipment. He had a small le- a lensless box camera that he. Um, was able to fit on his six-inch telescope, and uh, using that, that that meant also that he, uh, 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 contrary to um, what he was accused of, he he could not uh, photograph nearby objects with that, uh, because there was simply no lens in the camera, and uh, uh, he uh, he took photographs that, uh, as I show in my book, you know, are very very uh, of. of Things flying in the sky that are very similar to what um, uh, the Pentagon has now recently uh, um, authenticated as uh, as unidentified aerial phenomena. Right, um, and, and he also started lecturing, I guess, in in Southern California a couple of years later, nineteen eighty nine, um, UFO yeah. lectures. He was making um, some people claim some pretty outrageous claims. One of which was that. 
um, that um, uh, aliens exist on all planets uh, in, in, in our solar system, even our, you know, the giant gas planets and so forth. Uh, and that scientists know that this is the fact. Um, how, how is it possible that aliens, um, you know, cause he described Nordic and we'll get into the orthon a little bit later, but the Nordics and so forth, very human like, um, uh, aliens, how they could exist on a planet like Saturn, for example, or these giant gas planets. Yes. Um, you're right. He started lecturing in uh, from October 1949 onward uh, for service clubs like the Rotary, etc. Um, and, <clears throat> and at the time, uh, there were you know various scientists who were you know because there were there wasn't much uh, uh, known in terms of uh, findings through probes that were sent out. So it was it was a common. Um, um, a common assumption among scientists that there may well be life on other planets. I'm not sure if Adamski claimed that scientists knew what he knew, um, but what he knew um, is to do with the fact that, you know, we, in in my view, uh, that science uh, doesn't is is not able, um, as it admits, um, to point out where 96 percent of the universe is. You know, science, uh, as astronomy has has calculated the mass of the universe and what they see in terms of gas and planets and galaxies. When you all add all that up, uh, it amounts to only four percent of the calculated mass. The rest is invisible to um, to science, uh, our present day science. Um, my contention is that um, Adamski um, knows about life on other planets that has not precipitated onto the dense physical planes of matter that we know here, the, the, the dense physical, solid physical, the uh, liquid physical, and the, and the gaseous physical. Um, so, you know, we have to expand our, our view of, of life and how it manifests. And uh, this is where I think the, uh, the latest uh, scientific findings uh, come in. <clears throat> and um, uh, of course, there are there are plenty of uh, 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 traditional materialist scientists who um, hold fast onto you know the um, empirical uh, um, methods of our of our objective uh, solid material reality, uh, but that doesn't. Hold when you when you look at uh, science's own findings, um, Adamski uh, does say uh, that um, life extends across the universe, and all the planets in our solar system are inhabited. And he's not alone in claiming that. The um, the Aether's wisdom teachings uh, say the same thing. These are the teachings that were first. Uh, reintroduced to the modern world by uh, uh, Madame Helena Petrovna Bovatsky in the late 19th century, um, later expounded on by uh, by other people like uh, Alice Ann Bailey and, and Helena Rerich and, and Benjamin Krem, and um, the you know the, the the limitations of our present day science um, make it impossible thus far to establish. Um, uh, perception uh, of of forms of life on on other planets, but they are they are very much the same as as uh, life on on our planet. Uh, with and and the circumstances are very similar. People live in houses. There's there's uh, greens, there's trees, there's lakes and rivers, and and what have you. Except they are not on the dense physical planes, but on what we know as the etheric physical planes. Now, um, that's Adamski on one side and the Age of Wisdom teachings on the other side. But when you look at the, um, um, the latest findings in terms of, um, um, of, of, of system science and, and quantum, uh, quantum research, uh, they will tell you that uh, the, uh, material, uh, the material reality as we know it is very elusive when it comes down to it. It is only our perception, the way we experience these things that make them so solid, um, but that doesn't mean that there are very solid things that we can't see. 
All right. Um, we have to address some of the photographs that have been sort of held up as 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 proof that that Adamski was, uh, you know, a hoaxer or a fraud. And you, I'm sure you know the photos I'm referring to. There's one that looks all the world like a uh, some sort of a lamp. Uh, you can see light bulbs. It looks they look like light bulbs underneath it. People point to that photograph. Others that l- appear as if the craft was kind of cobbled together with household items. Just talk to me about uh, these, you know, th- these criticisms that these photographs simply don't stand up to, s- say, scientific scrutiny. Yes, these, these, um, uh, you're referring to uh, photographs, uh, close-up photographs of uh, what Adamski came to call uh, Venusian scout craft, where you can see portholes and you can see uh, um, uh, sphere-shaped landing gear, um, and um, it's um, yeah, the, the, the criticism uh, started with uh, Jim Mosley in 1955, who was uh, publishing a newsletter. And uh, he he took uh, one of Adamski's photographs, and there was a, an editor of uh, Yankee magazine um, who um, said, "I'll prove this is a fake because uh, see, I, I uh, take some household items and I uh, make uh, something that looks uh, almost uh, the same as what Adamski presents as a spaceship." Of course, Adamski. Um, uh, had a whole series of, of photographs uh, showing the same craft. Uh, late, and they, these were taken uh, mainly in 1953. And later on, he uh, produced a uh, uh, a film. Um, I, I don't remember if it's eight millimeter or, six, or sixteen millimeter film <clears throat> of the same craft hovering over uh, a residence in um, in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. <clears throat> and um, my my uh, problem with this uh, proof of Jim Mosley, presented by Jim Mosley, is that just because you can make something that looks like um, what was photographed by Adamski doesn't make make it a fake. Uh, th- there's no proof there. Um, it, it's uh, it it was you know it was it supported. Uh, Military or official denials uh, that uh, uh, that <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> mm. um, it, it supported official denials, of course, of uh, extraterrestrial extraterrestrials having uh, sought contact and making themselves uh, visible uh, to uh, various people, not just in California but around the world, and um, it is just a very poor. Um, uh, Proof of uh, of malice uh, because it isn't, and and the uh, uh, the fact that you make a make something that resembles something else, um, that's not proof. You know, that's just uh, uh, creativity, perhaps. Um, but it's uh, it, it it's it certainly denies uh, all the various different photographs from different angles that Adamski made. Also, the fact that uh, as was established by photographic experts of his time. It um, was either real, the object that he photographed, or it was a full-scale model. Well, everybody knows that uh, this was in 1953, um, and although he was beginning to become famous through his first book, co-authored with Desmond Leslie, um, you know, it was uh, 1953 when he took these photographs. He wasn't a rich man at all. So there was no way he could afford to have built a full-scale model with so much detail. And um, there was, uh, you know, there was a whole uh, whole string of uh, photographic uh, experts at the time who uh, concluded that this must be the real thing. And the, uh, uh, the irony is that the uh, critics, the detractors, they never managed to agree on exactly what item it was that he used for uh, for allegedly faking his photographs because one said it was uh, the top of an Italian ice um, ice cream machine and another said it was the top of a humidor, a cigar humidor, uh, and, and the list goes on. Most recently it was someone who said that it was the top of a lantern and that has also uh, been... Um, been debunked as uh, as the um, origin of Adamski's photos. So uh, criticism uh, just doesn't hold up. 
Right. I'm looking at one uh, here that's in the book. Uh, it's It's been referred to as Adamski's Chicken Brooder, uh, a photograph he claimed to be a UFO taken on 13th of December 1952. Uh, German scientist Walter Johannes Rydell said the photo was faked using a surgical lamp and that the the landing struts were general electric light bulbs. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's get to uh, perhaps what Adamski is best known for, and that is um, his contact with a Venusian entity or Venusian um, uh, alien by the, that went by the name of Orthon, taking place back in uh, 1952. Walk us through what happened in the Colorado desert. Um, it, it was uh, it was actually Adamski who called him Orthon. He uh, he uh, gave names to his contacts, who he said did not use names themselves, uh, but for easy. Uh, reference uh, in his books uh, describing his encounters and, and what they were telling him. He uh, he gave uh, these uh, human beings, he called them human beings, na- his own names uh, for, for his readers. Um, and what happened, uh, Adamski describes it, uh, begins this, uh, this episode in his uh, part of the book, Flying Sources Have Landed, uh, by saying it was about 12.30 in the noon hour on Thursday, 20 November 1952, that I first made personal contact with a man from another world. He came to Earth in his spacecraft, a flying saucer. He called it a scout ship. And so it was on the 20th of November when Adamski, with a group of uh, six friends and students, set out for a picnic, a lunch um, in the uh, in the California desert, um, uh, they went into the Coxcomb Mountains, um, and um, just before noon, they parked the cars. They were, they travelled in two cars. Um, Adamski had also brought his telescope, and uh, and he had a brownie camera. Um, and um, after they parked the cars, they first saw a, um, a cigar-shaped ship um, that was also entered in Project Blue Book as uh, uh, Special Report Number 14. Um, not long afterwards, they saw what we know as, as uh, flying saucers or scout craft emerge from the mothership, and apparently one of these... Um, seemed to have landed or was going to land in the nearby foothills. So Adamski went over and uh, to explore, and he felt himself in awe of uh, being so near a, uh, a craft, obviously from another world. Um, until he he says his reverie was uh, was broken when he suddenly realized uh, there was a man standing uh, not far from him, about a quarter mile from him, away from him. And he said his, his trousers were, were different, uh, uh, like ski trousers, and uh, uh, he had long hair reaching his shoulders. Um, so uh, it felt it was it was um, uh, he looked like a you know a perfectly normal human being, um, although his fingers were tapered. He said, and uh, uh, he felt uh, yeah he clearly felt. Um, in the presence of a very wise being, someone who could see through him, and uh, uh, at, uh, you know, in their in their exchange, uh, Adamski later explained that uh, the being was testing his telepathic abilities, um, uh, because later on it turned out that he could speak, uh, but on his first in the first moments of their encounter, um, they. Um, you know, they uh, uh, they were exchanging, trying to exchange thoughts and ideas uh, through gestures, and and uh, um, uh, yeah, not being able to, or, or seemingly not able to speak the same language. But uh, uh, later on, during his later contacts, he uh, and and not just Adamski, many many of the contactees have said that uh, the uh, the visitors from space uh, are very uh, very good at uh, picking up languages of the countries uh, that they visit, and they also have a, a translation device. And did Orthon um, communicate to Adamski that he was from the planet Venus? Yes, yes. He uh, uh, this was in the initial. Um, 
stages of uh, of their uh, exchange. Um, Adamski uh, asked where he was from by first pointing to himself and then to to the ground, uh, planet Earth, and then pointing to uh, to Orson, uh, where are you from? And Orson point um, uh, sort of uh, yeah pointed at the sun. And uh, then made an orbit, um, uh, the gesture of an orbit, and a second orbit, and then uh, pointed to himself. Uh, and from that, Adamski concluded that he was from Venus, which was later confirmed in, uh, you know, in in, in words. Um, so uh, yes, he was uh, he was from Venus. And uh, did it, uh, Adamski try and take a photograph of Orthon? Um, he, I, I don't remember if he tried to take. A, I don't think in the moment he um, had the presence of mind to um, to ask him for a, for a, what do we now <laughs> would do is ask for a selfie. Um, but um, he he did take a photograph of the uh, the foothills um, on his way there, and uh, recent enhancements of that uh, photograph, which was made by a simple brownie camera. Um, uh, 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 Swedish uh, Swedish photographer uh, um, René Erik Olsen, he uh, enhanced uh, these uh, these photographs, and the, this this particular one showed a uh, part of the source sticking out from behind one of the hills, and a uh, um, yeah a figure, um, not very clear obviously because there was a, a, a significant distance from which the photograph was taken, but there was a the clear silhouette and, and features of a man standing standing nearby the saucer. Uh, so there's no clear um, photograph of what Orson looks like. I, I understand that there, there were plaster casts taken of Orthon's shoe imprints. Yes, yes. Um, when um, when um, Orson had left, uh, Adamski noticed, um, also because Orson made a point of, of showing that he was uh, um, leaving these imprints in the in the sand in the in the in the ground uh, where they had met, and Adamski noticed uh, strange symbols in the in the footprints. Um, and uh, one of his uh, one of his friends that was with him, George Hunt Williamson, himself also an author and a researcher. Um, did uh, extensive research in the, uh, among the uh, Native Americans in South America. Um, he was uh, he, he he had a uh, uh, what do you call that uh, plaster with him, uh, so they could make a uh, uh, a plaster cast of uh, of the imp- of the footprints. Anything else unusual about them, or do they just look like shoe shoe prints in 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 the sand? Uh, or is there anything unusual about these plaster casts? Well, they they had uh, strange symbols. And these symbols, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, were also um, found by George Hunt Williamson on one of his expeditions in South America. I'm not entirely sure if these these were the ones, but uh, it was, um, um, yeah, some kind of uh, um, yeah attempt at at uh, letting us know certain things. Uh, but I, I must say, I haven't I haven't really studied. Um, the, this particular part of of the account, uh, because for me Adamski uh, Adamski's significance is much more in um, what he understood of life, and you know he was aware that consciousness is fundamental to to our objective reality. So I've never been too much into the physicality of flying saucer or spacecraft. Um, you know how how long were they? What was the azimuth of uh, where they were sighted? Um, it's about what what why are they here? And if if Adamski was teaching about the fundamental nature of consciousness in the 1930s and continued to do so throughout his life, despite uh, critics saying that he came into the flying saucer business because that's where the money was to be made. That's complete nonsense because in his in his books or his book Inside the Spaceships uh, that uh, relates many more of his uh, en- later encounters from 1953 onward. Um, he uh, he is 
told by his extraterrestrial contacts um, also about the the fundamental um, of consciousness being fundamental to to reality, and uh, in his even in his latest uh, books, uh, uh, Cosmic Philosophy and the Science of Life Study Course, he continues to talk about consciousness and the need for for humanity to expand its consciousness and its and its uh, understanding of life if we are to survive. He even said in a talk in 1955, the main thing is not, uh, you know, about about it's not about flying saucers or about me or any any other phenomenon. Uh, the main thing is what is transpiring in this world today, and what is transpiring now is that humanity and and the the coming of the the, the visitors from space is to do or is causing or and should be causing an expansion of our awareness of life and and the uh, and the nature of life so i'm uh, you know i'm i'm sorry but i'm not really into the specifics of the things that uh, many crit- because you, you know all these physical things can be disputed and have been disputed um especially if you don't read what Adamski said about it himself. You know, so many of the critics are just parroting the uh, the initial uh, so-called analyses by by Jim Mosley. And when you go when you go into it, uh, it doesn't just doesn't hold up the criticism. And uh, th- that's why, for me, the m- main part is is the uh, his his vision his the visionary quality of, of Adamski, he was aware of what is going on in the world. He was aware that we're at the at the um, you know a critical moment in a, in our history. And uh, as I said, you know, he he knew that there's more to life than just being born and dying, um, and that's it. And we have to make the best of it. Life so, is universal, right? Uh, I mean, can and, you and tell science. me? I'm sorry, science, and, and that's, I think, what I try to do in my book, science is uh, confirming these very fundamental notions that Adamski has been putting forward throughout his life and his career. Um, okay, so, but can we just, if we could just go back to Orthon for a moment, because what was, sure. um, can you share what Orthon's, uh, I guess, primary message to Adamski was? Hmm. Yes, that's another interesting uh, uh, aspect of of this uh, first encounter. Um, it, when Adamski asked him, "Why are you coming? Why? When's your visits? Why are you coming here?" and uh, uh, Orson then um, gestured, made gestures of the atomic clouds. Um, and Adamski checked. Uh, are you here because of the, uh, you know, the atomic bomb explosion? So, and it was also in the first report about this uh, uh, desert encounter in November '52. Uh, uh, four days later, there was a report in the Phoenix Gazette, and it actually headlined. Um, uh, let's see if I can. Uh, yeah, uh, here we are. Here we are. Uh, flying saucer passenger declares a bomb blast reason for visits. So it was it was the one of the main reasons for uh, for the uh, this, this visitors from space to come at this particular time in in our history. And of course, this has been um, uh, supported by uh, many other. Uh, many other contactees who were told the same thing in the same time. Um, there's plenty of other res- uh, UFO researchers who have come to the same conclusion that uh, you know we started uh, noticing Foo Fighters on the tails of fighter jets in World War uh, II, especially after uh, after the uh, atomic bombs on on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and uh, there have been numerous sightings of uh, UFOs over uh, nuclear uh, nuclear arm bases and, and testing grounds, starting in the 1950s or maybe even the 1940s. And of course, we're all. I'm sure most listeners are aware of the uh, the press conference uh, organized and, and the documentary made by um, 
Richard, uh, um, what's his name? Robert uh, Salas. Robert Salas. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, Robert Hastings. Robert Hastings. Robert Hastings. Right, in, right. In uh, yes. 2010. Um, who helped yeah, the UFO uh, incursion over Malmstrom Air Force Base in, that took place in exactly. 1967, and uh, where they shut down a bunch of ICBM missiles, took them offline. Exactly. Uh, and there were others in 67 as well, Malmstrom and um, um, Minot Air Force Base as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Robert Hastings, uh, for his documentary, uh, brought together uh, a group of 120 former and active uh, military officers who were uh, based at these uh, nuclear um, uh, missile uh, uh, facilities, uh, U.S. military facilities, and they all witnessed the same thing of of uh, missile shutdowns uh, involving UFO sightings. And, and his uh, his documentary from 2010 uh, documents uh, uh, the same thing from you know um, uh, unsuspected and or unsuspicious. What do you call that? You know, sources that that are reliable. These these military men who have been trained right. thoroughly. Right, so unimpeachable. Same, yeah. The same thing was already uh, told uh, uh, to George Adamski and reported by George Adamski in 1952. Um, in, uh, I think, 1955, uh, Adamski wrote another book called Inside the Spaceships. So, uh, as I understand it, uh, Orthon, uh, this entity from Venus that he, he gave this name to, Orthon, uh, arranged for Adamski to be taken uh, aboard one of these uh, crafts and uh, take it on a on a tour of the solar system. Tell me about that. Uh, yes, from February 1953 onward, um, contacts after the first contact in November 52 um, resumed, and uh, Damsky was regularly invited um, on board flying saucers, uh, taken to motherships. Um, and uh, inside the spaceships is actually uh, a very uh, significant account of especially the the insights that the uh, uh, the, the people from space, from especially from Mars, Venus, and Saturn, shared with him and asked him to share with the world, and uh, he did so in his book Inside the Spaceships, that came out in 1955. Um, and the uh, yeah, of course he was um, he was um, enthralled and and amazed and and of course uh, you know it, uh, you can only imagine how he must have felt being on on a spaceship and taken around the, the solar system or to you know around other planets around the moon. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, he had already described very similar experiences in his uh, book from 1949, Pioneers of Space, uh, which he later uh, described to a student as a, an out-of-body experience. So he must have had some idea of uh, what it was like, but I, I'm sure it uh, was a very different experience when you're in there, in the body, even if it was uh, not the physical body, but the etheric uh, body, the subtle body, um, that he, uh, because, you know, spaceships exist in uh, in etheric matter, or else they would be always visible. And, and they're clearly not, you know, they can just drop into or out of our range of vision at will, apparently, and uh, um, that uh, I submit they do uh, because they are able to lower the rate of vibration of the, um, uh, their atomic structures. And, um, yeah, for, so um, it, was, it was an... Um, uh, it, it was... Adamski describes the wonder that he experienced traveling through to other planets, through the solar system, but for him... The uh, significance was in the the wisdom that was shared by his contacts and their their, their insights into uh, the human lot and and the uh, the problems that are besetting uh, humanity and the world at this uh, this uh, juncture in history. What what did uh, Orthon? Um, uh, I mean, did he did he explain what um, what their uh, philosophy or spirituality was like? Um, 
Yes, uh, but even more so, uh, this was explained on two occasions, when, which he titled in his book, uh, Meetings with a Master. Um, to me, that refers back to um, masters of wisdom who are you know, the uh, uh, custodians of the wisdom teachings here on earth, uh, and, and they are the members of, of the uh, kingdom in nature that has evolved out of the human kingdom. Remember, we are talking about the evolution of consciousness, now, not just uh, a, a paranormal uh, enigma uh, presented to us, to humanity, to entertain us or to uh, to crack our brains on. Um, the uh, the coming of the visitors is uh, to do with the evolution of consciousness, uh, which doesn't stop at the human kingdom. You know, after it has emerged from the mineral and the vegetable and the and the animal uh, kingdom, uh, the evolution of consciousness continues, as is also uh, um, uh, described now, found by uh, by uh, you know the most uh, most advanced scientists uh, at the moment uh, in in quantum research and consciousness research, and uh, the uh, the wisdom that was shared by these what he called masters from Venus and Saturn is that life is universal, it uh, is a continuous manifestation, uh, consciousness is life becoming aware of itself, so it's, it's ever-evolving towards greater and greater um, um, un union with the source of consciousness. You know, and we find this again in the, at, at the, in the essentials of every world religion, you know, it's a it's a uh, um, a journey back back to God in in religious terms. Um, uh, the reconnection, which we find back in the word religion, religare, old Latin. Um, and um, in order to take the next step for humanity out of the dangerous zone that we are in now of, you know, ever-increasing uh, competition and conflict and, and the uh, nuclear annihilation that uh, is looming over the horizon again with, uh, with the uh, uh, emerging uh, conf conflicts in the world at the moment, uh, which was even more, more uh, immediate uh, and urgent in the 1950s, of course, with the, uh, with the Cold War and the yes. uh, Soviet and, and U.S., uh, uh, at loggerheads with their nuclear arsenals. Um, the, the way out of this seemingly uh, uh, perpetuous, perpetual uh, conflict, state of conflict, is to recognize that life is one and that we are one human family. We live, uh, we share the same planetary home, and we need to find ways not to compete with each other, but with our past achievements in order to create a world that uh, that uh, that uh, offers a place under the sun for everyone without having to uh, to resort to a killing or or armed conflict that is the essence of the message that um, that he was given and did orthos did orthon uh, say that um th did he pray does he did he pray to a creator believe in a creator um they uh, they they say that they don't necessarily pray, but they um, they have their um, their ceremonies in, in honor of um, the Creator. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, before people, the listeners start uh, you know shaking their heads and thinking, well, you know, here we are again. There's George Adamski. Uh, he uh, he came up with some kind of uh, new age um, UFO uh, religion. Uh, you, we find the same notions of a creator in in the latest uh, in the latest uh, science. Um, when you when you read um, the, the latest science in terms of of uh, quantum quantum uh, uh, quantum research, uh, not just quantum mechanics, but uh, but the, the next stage in in quantum research, you find that there's uh, I'm, I'm just re I'm reading a book now, very interesting. Uh, it's from 2009. It's by Dwayne Elgin, American author, and also has a scientific background. It's called The Living Universe, and the way he describes it is that um, the, the, 
what we know as individual consciousness is also at the basis of our objective reality, and that emerges from there must be a source for that consciousness. And um, uh, it's you know our universe is just one of uh, of, of many, uh, either incarnations of of the universes or uh, universes uh, that exist at the, at the same time. And so even the most uh, the most advanced insights from science are talking about the creator, and uh, that is and it doesn't really matter if you call it God. Um, if, if you feel the need, you can pray to it or you can you can uh, worship it. Um, but the best thing we can do is to try and find our own way to express and manifest as much of that original um, consciousness in our own lives. And we do that, as Adamski was told, as we find in the Age of Wisdom teachings, as Professor Irvin Laszlo describes in his books, um, the Intelligence of the Cosmos, for instance, or What is Reality, the recent books by Professor Laszlo, is to um, to realize that we are one human family and that we need to look after each other um, in terms of social justice. Every human being, every man, woman, and child in this world has the right to adequate housing, food, sh- um, uh, health care, and education. And if we if we decide as a human family to look after all of our family members, um, then there's no need for conflict. And um, you know, it doesn't mean that we should resort to uniformity. Uniformity is the manifestation of fascism. Nobody wants fascism. In the, nobody in the right mind wants fascism. And it was certainly not the um, you know what Adamski was was told. What heard from from his space contact that everybody needs to do the same and be the same and think the same, um, but that we have to pool our resources, our talents, and our our um, 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 you know the, the, uh, everything that we've learned and know how um, to build a better future for everyone uh, to to contribute our talents to the common good rather than trying to uh, to uh, get the best only for ourselves we have right. we have yes right when Adamski was sort of touring the solar system uh, on board these crafts uh, and he described things that he saw on the lunar surface um structures and and so forth mm. were any of these um, verified. I mean, later there were reports of, you know, um, uh, classified uh, NASA photographs that were that were uh, photoshopped to remove certain structures. But uh, people inside NASA claim they saw things on the moon, on the surface of the moon, structures, man-made uh, structures. Do any of those reports line up with what Adamski reported seeing on the moon back in the fifties? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware of these uh, classified photographs uh, or, or um, things uh, reported, recorded, also by astronauts. But uh, yeah, they are classified. And you know, with respect, it's the same as with his photographs and and uh, and the uh, footprint casts and and any other kind of evidence that that Adamski presented in his time. You know, they're. Uh, they've been forever uh, a source for debate, um, and if 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 you'll allow me, if if you, when you step back for a minute, what emerges is a picture of uh, an increasing a number of uh, confirmations of the the notions, the general notions that Adamski put forward in the 1950s. You know, we discussed the photographs at the, at the beginning of the show. Um, uh, the photographs or the video evidence from from um, uh, the Pentagon that was leaked um, uh, from U.S. Navy uh, jet fighter board cameras are very similar to what Adamski photographed already in 1950. Um, anomalous materials are now being researched by by a uh, Stanford professor, Gary Nolan, and, and uh, also in the 1950s, Adamski said he had anomalous materials that he had an- analyzed. 
history of contact uh, from that we discussed earlier, um, there are now various scientists who say that contact has been made, who confirm that contact has been made, even though they say, uh, you know, the um, extraterrestrials have asked not to uh, make it known because humanity is not yet ready. You know, you remember in December 2020, it was uh, the uh, Israeli um, former head of Israeli s s space program who uh, who made the headline. Um, the nuclear concerns uh, that was reported in the first report about Adamski's contact in the desert, uh, later confirmed in 2010 through Robert Hastings' documentary. Um, the fact that life is universal, Adamski said humanity can be found all over the universe. And now scientists are saying, evolutionary biologists say, well, the likelihood that life evolves to the point that they are very much like what we know as human beings, is actually the favored bet in the universe. All these things, the, the fact that consciousness is fundamental to, uh, to our reality, uh, confirmed by, uh, by uh, quantum research, all these things added up show that George Adamski was a visionary. You know, and again, the the I understand people's people's uh, fascination with with evidence, but uh, there's all I'm I'm just not um, I haven't been uh, cleared for <laughs> to to see the uh, the NASA photographs uh, classified photographs of the moon surface. No, no, but you've, you've heard about the reports that, that have come out of, uh, from supposed whistleblowers describing what they saw on the moon in these photographs, structures, um, you know, buildings and so forth. I, I was just, I guess, getting at, does, you know, whether that lined up with what Adamski claimed he saw on the moon as well. Gerard, did uh, George Adamski make any predictions about when a disclosure might happen or how it would happen under what circumstances? He was expecting, um, at various points, expecting um, what we now call disclosure. Um, and obviously, uh, that hasn't happened. Um, and, and, of course, official disclosure is necessary. But when you actually read what Adamski has to say about life uh, on Earth and, and in the universe, uh, it is not essential official disclosure for knowing what's really going on. Um, he, as I pointed out, uh, Adamski was aware of the, uh, the juncture, junction in, in history that, uh, that we're at as, as a human race. Um, and we need to make a step in our, in our consciousness. Um, uh, Grant Cameron, the uh, well-known uh, uh, also, a Canadian uh, researcher said that consciousness is the elephant in the room when it comes to full disclosure. And uh, Damsky is the only one of the early contactees who has been, who was teaching about the nature of consciousness uh, even in the 1930s and continued to do so throughout his life. Um, and he also uh, described how consciousness was. Uh, um, um, used in in the craft that he was invited on uh, to uh, um, you know to to operate the instruments and the ships. Um, so th you know th there's um, and that's why I called my book the Adamski book of UFO UAP disclosure. There's s several things have been confirmed now by science, by philosophers, by activists, by the military, um, and when we keep looking at these separately, um, you know, we don't really get a full picture. But when you add them up and you see that Adamski was already, had already disclosed uh, these things um, in the 1950s, sometimes even earlier, um, then it becomes clear that he was a visionary and that the, the, the purpose of the, the intentions of the visitors from space clearly, is not to cause harm, or else they would have done so, as Robert Salas also uh, stated in the uh, Robert Hastings documentary. You know, they're, they're clearly capable of, of doing damage, and they haven't, except for shutting down missiles that were later um, 
uh, uh, back online, uh, you know, without problems. Uh, they are here in support of a momentous time in, in human history, and um, it is up to us to realize, to make a step in our in our conscious awareness, in our, the way we relate to each other, to our fellow human beings, um, relate to the planet in order to save it. We're destroying our own planetary habitat as we speak. Um, we have been. Adamski has been uh, pointing that out also and, and had, had it told to him by his uh, uh, contacts from space in the 1950s and the 1960s. And uh, we've allowed the uh, you know, big corporations to, uh, to buy up new inventions, uh, uh, zero-point energy uh, inventions, and, and, and shelve them so that they could continue to, uh, to make profits on the fossil and nuclear fuel industries. Um, disclosure um, begins by acknowledging that Adamski was correct in in uh, many of the fundamental notions and and things that are now have now been confirmed. And if we continue to ignore his information and his account, we perpetuate the ignorance that was imposed by the disinformation campaign that was designed to confuse and scare the public about the uh, extraterrestrial presence on Earth. Um, so, um, yes, he, uh, he was expecting disclosure, official disclosure, um, and he was also expecting a, this, this uh, transition into a better future uh, you know, without without armed conflict, and he was expecting a, that was it, even in 1940, I believe he was expecting that would that would take place in uh, in about 30 years, and obviously that hasn't happened because it depends on uh, on our humanity's um, ability and willingness to take a good hard look at ourselves and how we relate to life and to our environment and our community and, and, and our neighbors, whether it's our neighbors next door, our neighbors in the next country over, um, and, and the people that we have been allowed to be exploited uh, just for, you know, capital gains. Gerard, thank you so much. I had a great time. I, uh, I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much, Richard. It was a pleasure. Gerard Artson, the Adamski book of UFO UAP disclosure. All right. For George Norrie, George Knapp, Lisa Lyons, Stephanie Smith, Tom Danheiser, Dan Galanti, Michael Cozio, Donna Walker, Chris Burroughs, Tim Banal, Sean Lattistor, and in Brantford, Ontario, Scott Park. I'm Richard Serrett. Thank you for your ears and your voices, your beautiful voices. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.